Yes, ma'am. Hi, good afternoon. I really am quite humbled to be here. Um, I live on a ranch near Fisher on the other side of Blanco, and so I don't get out very often, so it's really nice to be out with you. I get to have my neighbors here from the Episcopal Church in Blanco, so it's good to see them, and um, it's good to see all of you. In the end, uh, what I hope we do is excite you about taking care of some of your stuff today. Is that fair? So I want you to start visualizing that closet, that attic, that storage unit, that garage, and I want you to visualize what am I going to do with that? Not me, but what are you going to do with that? And really that's what the presentation's about. Um, I'm going to get into a little bit of genealogy. Uh, I'm going to get into stuff and I'm going to get into what I call digitizing the stuff or curating the stuff uh, so that you can pass that along to the children without necessarily passing on the stuff. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's where we're headed. So um, the book itself, did everybody get a copy of that or access? You're welcome to pick up a copy. I'm going to be referring to it. In fact, um, can I trouble, I, I apologize, can I trouble somebody to bring me a copy? Because I'm gonna, I'm gonna be reading from it, but feel free to pick up a copy now so you can take a look at that. But where I'm going, I'm sorry. But where I'm going with this is I'm gonna be sharing with you. Thank you so much. You are such a helper. Thanks. Uh, where I'm gonna be going with this is that um, all my stuff, digital stuff, books, is at Answers.Academy. So let me just give you the drive-by elevator speech of what is Answers.Academy. Uh, I'm a retired educator, and I believe, I believe deeply, we need to have more conversations in our country. Amen? Amen. So everything that I write is about an encouragement of conversation. And so the books that I'll show you later on drones or kayak fishing or bicycling or becoming an old man, and this book, it's written so that you and your family will have a conversation about your stuff. Is that okay? That's where I'd like to go with it. So later I'll talk about in Answers.Academy. But first of all, let's just jump into it. So you've got stuff, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And so what are you gonna do with that stuff? You got lots of stuff, right? Is there anybody who would say, no, not really? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm honest. There's, there's some people, I when I present, there are some people that just say, yeah, I'm taking care of it. So it's possible and it does happen. But what I would ask is that you've just got so much stuff, you don't even want to think about it. That's right. And unfortunately, that's really where we're at is a lot of people don't want to think about it. And we get into our little, what's called the habit loop or that, what I call the habit of keeping stuff. So in the end, what I want to talk about today is, well, let's start off by just talking about stuff. Turns out that stuff itself, well, I, this is the genealogy part of the presentation. Where does the word stuff come from? When I first used the word, I thought, well, that's kind of impolite to say, Bill, where's your stuff? And instead of stuff, I could use other words. And it turns out there's a lot of other words, but the genealogy of the word stuff is there. It's both Old English, Old French, and Greek. Mm -hmm. And I especially like the Greek meaning because that's sort of the heart of what I want to present about is what draws us together. And unfortunately, what draws us together after we pass is your and my stuff that we didn't take care of. And guess who deals with it? Kids. Okay, and generally, what do the kids do with your and my stuff? <laughs> right, so we agree. The general rule of thumb is that we, that's what happens to it. So in other words, though, if you looked at the synonyms of other words that I could have used or we could use instead of stuff, these are the synonyms for the word stuff. Recognize any words there? And they're a lot more polite, aren't they? I could be talking about my possessions. I could talk about my chattel. I could, you know, et cetera. But there are two words up here that really grab me. Which words grab you up here? Which words would you rather talk about with your kids? Thank you, Director. Heirloom. Heirloom, yes, I mean, keepsakes. But in the end, no matter what we call it, it still boils down to stuff, right? Two of the words that caught my attention were personality, not personality, but personality and things. And it turns out that things, if you look up the definition, there's two of the definition for things. 
So it's something that I can touch, something that needs to be dealt with. So that's, that's reasonable, right? Mm -hmm. But personal tea is another interesting one. It's a transportable item that one, you know, things that I can move around. So the argument is that no matter what we call it, stuff or personally or things or heirlooms or keepsakes, we still have to deal with it, right? So these are words. Can I give you a word picture of what this really is gonna look like? <laughs> <laughs> and let me know in the back if you cannot read that. Can y'all read the caption? Can y'all read the caption? Okay, it says, one day, son, all this will be yours. <laughs> And he's so excited. And he's so excited. <laughs> so let's just breathe that in for a second. You know what I mean? This is probably, unfortunately, close to reality, right? So let's just breathe that in for a second. And I've actually been here, done this with my dad, our dad. And so I wrote a chapter in the book called The Last Storage Unit. And I wrote about this kind of experience. Uh, you will also find it. By the way, I'm going to get into it in just a second. But I spent about six years writing this book. I interviewed well over... 50 people, and in interviewing people, I found a lot of stories, and so the book really is a reflection of the stories, but this is not uncommon. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's different from this picture is that the young man is standing there by himself, and there's no dad there. Mm -hmm. So that's the word picture that I wanna give you. I don't consider it scary, I consider it a responsibility that I have, and I wrote about it in one chapter about what's your legacy? How will you be remembered? Will you re be remembered as the person who left us a bunch of stuff that we have to deal with? Or, or what's the other possibility? So I'm here today just to offer that reality says that if we do this, and I'll just trail off at that, I'll just trail <laughs> off into the sunset, right? All right, so today what I wanna do as I want to talk about the book, the ideas in the book, I'd like to talk about digitizing the past and give you an example of that. And then I want to talk with you, I want to have a conversation. So I'm eager for your questions, what about, what about, what about. And then I want to put on the table, uh, let's do a workshop. Let's do a workshop together. Um, that's my offer, you don't have to accept. But my offer is sometime in the future, let's do a workshop where we actually do the stuff that I'm talking about doing. Is that okay? So that's the, kind of my little agenda. First of all, the book itself, if you want to turn to page 17, my main character is Mario. Mario is the manager of a storage unit. How many books do you know about that the main character is the manager of a storage unit? And if you look at page 17, I won't read it to you, but what I try to convey on page 17 was this sense, and this I got this on a lot of interviews, especially the last chapter, the scene that I paint is Mario wakes up and there's two cars at the gate, all with the lights on, waiting to get in. And it's two daughters who are fighting over their dad's stuff and there's an attorney in each car, right? So Mario had seen this so many times, it made him sad. He did set down his coffee and got up from the open wooden arms of his mother's rocking chair, the one thing he had inherited from her, and he walked slowly to open the Museum of Me, the name of his storage unit, gate to greet children of a man's lost legacy. Drum roll, violin, whatever you want to play. But that is, that is not uncommon. I'm also here to tell you that's not always the way it works out. And I've interviewed a lot of people who did not have acrimony. They got along, they settled it, they talked, and that's the encouragement that I give you in this book, right? So just in full disclosure, Mario doesn't really exist. He's really a reflection of all the interviews that I had, but I thought it would be more fun to talk about quilts and music and art and books more from the standpoint of this is what people experience. Fair? So that's what Mar who Mario is in the book. The other thing that's important on page 39, if you want to skip to that, a big part of the idea that I want to share with you is that analog is anything that I can touch. It's made of atoms and molecules and it's stuff, it's things, it's personality. It's the stuff that we talk about, right? But what does it mean to be digital? Where do things go when they're digital? So let's breathe that in just a second. Technically speaking, they're not atoms. They're zeros and ones in a computer. They are electrons that go 
one way or the other, depending on the code and et cetera, but they don't exist in reality. My iPhone may exist in reality. My computer exists in reality, that's analog. But digital is stuff that's in it, right? So what I'm arguing is that digitizing your family's past is a matter of capturing the stories and pictures and videos and putting it into the digital world. Pause. What do y'all think of that? Just makes sense? But who does digital? Do we do digital? Or do our children do digital? Yeah, okay, Connie, Connie does digital. She's hired. Okay. But typically, typically, Connie's not typical, but typically it's the younger children, it's the children, the high school kids, your children, your grandchildren, and I'm guilty of seeing children spending too much time on their digital devices. What if we say, hey, would you help me? I'd like to record the story of this quilt. Could you take your digital device, digital native, grandchild, and could you tell, help, let me tell the story of it? and you record that for me, you follow? Mm -hmm. So the way I try to express that in page 39, I'm gonna read a little bit. Um, Mario has a daughter who's a digital native, and Mario has a client who says, I've got all these photos, what do I do with them? So uh, then she, the daughter, showed Mario, and I'm on page 39, showed the, uh, Mario and his client how to move the scanned photos to save photo files from the photo taking a picture of the photo and then it's on the computer. She could text or email these photos, put them on Facebook, save them to a hard drive, or save them to the cloud. You know, the internet speak for stored in a remote computer. A hard drive is a small portable box that was a separate digital storage space for the photos and not inside the client's computer. So if the computer dies, I still have my little storage yeah. unit. The cloud option is simply sending the scanned photo to computer servers that exist somewhere in the world that were secured and shareable with family members via the internet. She showed and explained this process in very simple terms. The client was tickled to learn and gathered up his smartphone to head over to his uncle's house. Mario gave his daughter a big hug, saying, I'm so proud of my digital daughter. She smiled back in analog. <laughs> so does that make sense, yeah. what I'm suggesting there? So if you think about stuff becoming digital, then it's just a matter of how do I do that? And where do I store it? Do I store it on a hard drive, the cloud, the internet? I would not suggest keeping it on your main computer. Just put it somewhere that your children have access to it. And I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and sort of go to my conclusion in my talk. If you do that, you have the ability to give every one of your children a hard drive. You have everyone, you can give them access to the internet and the cloud. You basically are giving them your digital stuff and it costs them nothing. And then, whether they keep the cherished photo, this is my mother, our mother, whether they keep the cherished photo or not, they have a copy of that. And I'm gonna give you examples of me talking about our mother and her legacy, you follow? Mm -hmm. So this then becomes less important because they've got, okay, you get that? That's kind of a transition but that's what I'm offering. Not, not necessarily right about that, but that's what I'm offering for the idea. Take the stuff and digitize it, period. Cool. That's analog, so that's another idea in the book. The other idea in the book is what I call the habit of keeping things. Let's breathe that in. Are we in the habit of keeping things? Thanks for scanning to that page 139. The research on habits is that there's a thing called a habit loop. A habit loop is what we do when we do our habits. Not all habits are bad, not all habits are good, but they all follow the same pattern. So if you ever get interested in habits and how to change them, here's what you wanna know. A habit is a loop. There's three parts of a habit. There's a cue. I saw the Dairy Queen sign. I wanted a blizzard. That the cue is that you know something that says I want, right? Different variety. Then it's a follow. We follow what's called a routine. We go through the drive-through and go through the drive-through to get that reward. And then the reward is my Dairy Queen blizzard. Fair. Mm -hmm. Translate that in your own life. 
What are your cues? What are your routines? And what are your rewards? And it turns out the research shows, don't try to change the cue. They're gonna happen. Don't try to change the reward necessarily. The thing that's easy to change is the routine. Don't drive through the drive-through, drive another direction, right? And find a different reward for that, I want some sugar or whatever it is. So, so specifically, the habit of keeping things is the habit of accumulating things, the habit of accumulating things and the habit of storing things, right? That's the routine. So in the book, in this chapter, I simply argue, it's, it's science, the science of habits. If I have a habit of keeping things or of accumulating things, I'm not gonna change the cue. I'm not gonna change that desire for more clothing or more books or more whatever. I'm not gonna change that cue. What I'm gonna change is how I act on that cue and then I'm gonna set up different rewards. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's it. That's what I offer in the book as an idea. One to play with, so at least you may not be dealing with the stuff you've got, but at least you're not accumulating more. And honestly, that's a big part of the battle, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> when things are in a storage unit, they're out of sight, they're in the garage attic, it's like, oh, I've, I've got room. I've got room for more golf clubs. <laughs> I've got room for more music, right? So that's the argument in this, in this one. And then this is not exactly my idea, but I make reference to it on my YouTube channel. There's a YouTube channel I'll talk about in a second but there's a book called Your Money or Your Life. Mm. Have you read it? Have you ever seen it. that before? It's a great book. I highly recommend it. Your Money, think about that, Your Money or Your Life. And they talk about currency and about money and how money comes and goes out of our life. But one of the chapters they talk about is this curve. Um, I wish I could represent it now. I don't have internet um, or I'd show you the video. But do go to my YouTube channel, Our Museum of Us on YouTube. You'll see it. But they basically argue that over our lifetime, if this is stuff and this is over time, that what we do is as we are young, we accumulate more and more and more. And then what happens? Do we continue to accumulate until we pass away? Not really. There's a, a, a moment that we curve, that, that, that the accumulation curves and it starts to go down just a little bit, depending on who we are, right? And they have a scientific term for this peak of the hill, they call it enough. <laughs> I have enough. <laughs> have you ever reached that point where you say, hmm, I got enough? Mm -hmm. And that's what they argue. So all I did was called it, using their phrase, hills of enough. And here's the challenge. If you feel like you have enough, if you think of it as a hill of enough, I refer to it on my YouTube video as that t-shirt, what hill? You know, are you over the hill? What hill? I don't know that I'm over the hill. So I would just offer to you, think about that feeling of having enough. Think about the downward curve towards the last years of our life where we start shedding through digitizing, through donation, through giving away this, this, the hill of enough. That's all. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And then the last idea, the last two ideas is this, and this kind of surprised me, honestly. Um, um, in full disclosure, this is when we were helping our father empty out his last storage unit. He's still alive, he's 94 in Beaumont, Texas. He's doing great in assisted living, um, has just enough stuff around him. But when we uh, went through his storage units in his house, um, is really quite an experience. I don't know if you've done this before, I'm sure you have, to be around somebody as you're emptying out their house to move them into assisted living, etc. See if this story resonates with you. And I just call it the last storage unit. It could be the last attic, the last garage, but it's what happens when you're at the end of that chapter and you say, oh poop, right? I'm not going to have this stuff anymore, what do I do? And the first thing that most people report saying and what our dad said, and I put it in this chapter, was nobody's gonna want any of this, right? And the truth is, <laughs> right? So that's the point at which it really hit me as I was about halfway through this book, it really hit me that 
we didn't want his stuff. We didn't want his pants or his tarps. You know, the tools were useful. There were a few collectibles, and et cetera, but that's where we really disaggregate what's stuff and what's heirloom, mm -hmm. right? He had cool heirloom stuff that he's shared with us and et cetera. But I just offer to you as an idea, there are people in your life, probably, who are close to or already have dealt with their last storage unit. You're going to be interacting with them in that way. And then, guess what? We're gonna be dealing with our own last storage unit. And so everything I'm, it's sort of a sense of urgency before you get to your last storage unit, start digitizing your stuff, start sharing it, giving it away and et cetera. And that's what I, that's the burning platform I give you in this book. Is that fair? Okay. And then the last idea came from our, then this is the last chapter of the, second last chapter of the book. Uh, my dad's older sister is Aunt Robbie. She lived to 94 in Lufkin, Texas, where she grew up and lived for 65 years in the same house. Um, our family was originally from Apple Springs and great grandpa said to Papa, get out of here. You know, you, you need to get, and so he moved to Lufkin, started a big cotton farm, had five kids and all of them did well educationally, you know, a couple of PhDs and da 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 da. But all that to say that our, our aunt Robbie was the one who stayed at home, raised kids, had a lot of stuff in the last years of her life, I noticed the last 10 years of her life, she was the happiest person I think I've ever known. She was the most angelic person I think I've ever known. And as I kind of go visit her all the time, she passed away two years ago, I noticed there was something about her that she was not anxious for stuff. She was not anxious. What's the Philippians, be anxious for nothing? She was not anxious. And so I started thinking about, well, so Mark, what's your point? I get rid of my stuff, I become a minimalist, I get rid of my kids, then what's your point? What am, what am I supposed to do after I get rid of all my stuff? I'm here to stop myself to say, don't get rid of all of it. Have an Aunt Robbie day. And an Aunt Robbie day means what? Share. You have just enough stuff, you're happy, just enough books, just enough music, just share enough art, excess. say that. Share your excess. Yeah, share the excess, but when you're done, you're here at home having an Aunt Robbie day. You've got your quilt from Mama. You've got your photo of your mom. You've got, and in my case, I write about it in the last chapter, our mother was killed when she was 44 years old. And so what I want, I was the executive director, what I wanted was the rocking chair, her rocking chair. And I put it on YouTube. It's the last chapter of the book, but it, that's, that's, and so that's part of my having an Aunt Robbie day is to go sit in my mom's rocking chair. I call it the open wooden arms of our mother's rocking chair. And I have conversations with mom, fair? So I stopping myself and I'm stopping you from getting rid of everything. Keep the items around you that you value, treasure, that cause you to be less anxious and keep them with you until your last day is what I would offer. What do y'all think? That makes sense? So I'm not saying being becoming a minimalist, keep the stuff that you enjoy and just that. And that's my la that's my offer. So, is we okay? There's the book, there's the ideas, and I don't have access to the internet, but y'all are free to go to YouTube, go to uh, our Museum of Us, and then I've got, I talk about most of the chapters in there but I encourage you to do that. It's funny, <laughs> um, I played tennis in high school and college, so my tennis coach is still alive in Midland, Texas, and I sent him a copy of the book. I thank him in the book. He was a really, really good guy, still is. And so I thought, you know, he'd read the book and he'd give me feedback. About a year later, I called him and I said, what do you think of the book? And he said, I'm sorry, Mark, I honestly didn't read it. But he said, I looked at your YouTube and I got it, and so I got copied them up by my brother and my da 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 da, da. <laughs> So what I'm learning, this is a big surprise for me as an English teacher, um, more people are responding to the YouTube videos than the book. So I would argue do both, because there's a lot of resources 
at the back of every chapter mm -hmm. that are not in the uh, YouTube, and I'll talk about more. But all that to say that, if you can go to the YouTube channel and check that out, I'd encourage that. Any thoughts on that? <clears throat> Please. I, I went to YouTube and looked. I found the introductory one. I couldn't find any more than that. They're there. Just go to the home. Click the home button. Okay. okay. And then I'll make sure it's more obvious. But okay. uh, click on home. There's, I think, about 20 to 25 videos there. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so, yeah, they're, they're only, oh, and here's good. the rule. If you want to make your own YouTube channel, um, the rule of thumb is uh, make them three to five minutes long and keep them short and simple. Mm -hmm. And then I use that tripod and that iPhone, mm -hmm. and I just set it up and I record myself. It's really the same process, like when I talk about something that's under that quilt I'll show you in a second. I just stand out in my backyard and I talk about that thing, tell the story of it, and then stop and put it up on YouTube. So it's that straightforward, okay? All right, so here's my offer to you, and I can deal with rejection. <laughs> happens a lot but I would love to be able to offer something like a two-hour workshop with this society um, so that we actually just come here and do it and bring something I'm gonna model that for you right now but bring something so you have the idea and then um, then use based on that idea something you could go do on your own okay so no commitments on your part I just want to make that offer and that's what I would imagine we would be doing and the values list is in the book i probably won't flip to it right away but as i noticed i noticed um it's um it's on page 187 i noticed when i started talking and telling people to record what values does this stuff have and i'm going to give you an example right now i didn't i didn't I, I had a hard time thinking about what do you mean by values what what's a value which that have friendship charity honesty trust so i just made a whole list of values here so as you're digitizing stuff on 187, um, and then on 186, what's the item, and then what value does that reflect for me? So that's kind of a workbook where you could get started by yourself. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So is that clear? Mm -hmm. And again, no pressure at all. I just would love to come back and get to do um, 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 some a workshop with you. But let's just jump in. You ready to digitize? So as you visualize digitizing, um, here's just, I've got three examples for you. First of all, um, a photo, this is one of my accidental discoveries. When I would sit with Aunt Robbie, she had all the photos of our family and Papa and Mama and the cotton farm, and, you know, the brothers, my, my dad and her, his four siblings, three boys and Aunt Robbie. And I accidentally came across the question that I asked her and I encourage you to use this. I would go to Aunt Robbie. Can you play with me? Okay. Aunt Robbie, what do you see in that picture? I see a lovely lady. And Aunt Robbie will go on and on about the lovely lady and the time I remember when your mom did this and this and this. So if you can set this up and say what's in this picture, then think of all those photos you have that people remember who's in the photo, who is that, what did they do, da, da, da. Make sense? And then second, and I'm actually going to donate this very expensive tripod to the Genealogical Society. Then what I do, and I usually use that phone, but just for sake of example, I will set this up right here. And then I'll say, Aunt Robbie, what do you see in that photo? Then microphone, this has a little light and I'm recording and Aunt Robbie can do this on her own or as the digital child or grandchild, I can do it for her with her, period. But I will tell you this, after doing this with Aunt Robbie 30 and 40 and 50 times, <laughs> at the end of that, after three or four years, can you imagine what her affect was? She had told the stories of her stuff she was already not anxious, but she was just like, you know, not only has somebody listened to me, but it's been recorded. And so now when we talk about, huh, I hadn't planned this, but let me just tell you an example of what you, the story you told me. Thank you for being at Robbie. We had this cool round table in our family that was Papa, Mamas, and the five children ate around that table. 
and Aunt Robbie had that table at her house, so I said, tell me the story of this table. So she told me the story of this table, and after the third or fourth time I asked that, she said, oh, there's some dents in the table somewhere, and we went around the table and found the dents. She said, that's where your papa would shoot the squirrels and bring them in, and with his pin knife, he would bash the brains out of the squirrel so that instead of chicken and dumplings, we would have squirrel and dumplings. And I don't think she would ever thought that or ever told that story. And sure enough, we ran around and we found a little dent mark for Papa with his pen knife had bashed out the brains of a squirrel for Mama to make. And I'm sorry I'm shocking you, but it's, in East Texas, it's really done. Okay. <laughs> so I was like, wow. And so we caught that story. It's part of that table's history is now anybody can go and look and hear Aunt Robbie talking about the little dents in the table, period. So, you never know what you're gonna get. Okay, you ready for the surprise? Yep. What's under this quilt? By the way, this is a quilt that Mamaw made. Uh, part of her legacy was that she made every one of us a quilt and an afghan, 26 grandchildren. And so this is my quilt from Mamaw. And there's a whole chapter about quilts. Who was quilting today? I mean, Quilts are like the coolest thing in the world. I, a couple of years ago, I had two made. I didn't make them, but I designed them and had people who could quilt and gave them to my children. And it's like, wow. I mean, I lose words. I'm a writer and I lose words when I think about the power of quilts as a gift. Mm -hmm. So this is Mamaw's quilt and you were sharing. This is fabric from the 30s? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I know that she kept quilts and they kept old uh, toe bags or mm -hmm. What am I trying to say? Flower uh, sacks. Flower, flower, flower sacks. sacks. And they would yeah. make clothes and quilts out of flower yeah. sacks. Yeah. That's, that's, I that's what some of those are. Those are yeah. so those different features. There's all kinds of stories about, tells about, you know, growing up in the Depression and mm -hmm. usefulness and utility mm -hmm. and resourcefulness. And mm -hmm. I find I have that same values because of da 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 da. So this is, the, I write about this in a chapter. Uh, I talk about it on the video. I was given this, it's on the cover. I was given this um, when I was 12 years old. It is a um, 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 birthday present. It's an old army trunk that my mom and dad antiqued, and I've had it my whole life. And since I'm only 29, I've only had it for about 17 years. But I digress. Here's a challenge for you. This is a challenge for myself. What if I could reduce all my stuff to one hard drive and one trunk of, bit of analog stuff. Ready? So that's my challenge to you. What if you could, this is what you leave. Here, add stuff in the trunk, right? Yeah. I know, I know, I know, but there, you know, if I put the digital, okay, you get the idea. So in the trunk, let's see what we find. It turns out that mom's, mom's dad was a writer, well, not a writer, but he was a storyteller from Missouri. James Patterson Crockett, and his nickname was Jimmy High Pockets because he was always growing out of his pants. We lived, he lived in East Hunt, Huntsville. Um, we would move around, and as we moved around, he would miss us so much, he would write us stories about growing up as a child. Uh, there's, I know, isn't this cool? So what do I do with this? So I'm in the process of making this a book for Amazon along with my other books. And I have interviewed a lot of people that have these kind of things. So I can leave behind this in my trunk, but I can also leave behind a copy of the book that I will publish on Amazon for all of my siblings to share in Jimmy High Pocket's story. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Okay, exhibit A. Now what's the value there? I think I read about his grandson became a writer. <laughs> she was a librarian when she was tragically killed, she was a librarian in the maximum security prison at Huntsville State Penitentiary and was killed in a hostage siege that happened in 1974. So Jimmy High Pockets, writer, mom, librarian. I mean, do you see the thread? And I'm not trying to make anything up that I this special, but that's, that's absolutely the story that I want to tell about Da, 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 da. Okay, got that? So that's another excerpt, but there's one more. Oh, two more. 
<laughs> this is this is me. Um, this is a, a gift that I was given by my high school sweetheart, and uh, it didn't work out. Yep, I'm going to set it. But I swear, you know, your first love, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and I just I can't let that go. Nobody will appreciate it, but as, so I just can't let it go, period. There's just some stuff that's so sentimental, so emotional, but this fits in the trunk, so good thing she didn't give me a Ferrari or something. <laughs> but, you know, I'll keep this and the kids will have to deal with it. They'll go drink beer or something, but there are some things that are just so emotional, there's, I don't know how to let go of them. So, of my heirloom German Stein. Last one, on the Cotton Ranch, in Lufkin, Texas, uh, we had the grandpa and the boys built a house, really beautiful house, not expensive, just solid, and they built the barn. So then Papa dies in 55, Mama dies in 99, she was 99 years old. So they, the five siblings sold the house, the guy took it and moved it to another part of Lufkin, and then they had to, then they sold the property to a church, so they had to take the barn down. Well, you can imagine the barn, the value, the history, the ethics, the about a barn, right? So what do you do when you take a barn down? A barn's gone. All the stories, all the values, that, that, that. But it turns out one of my oldest uncle was a, became a professor at Stephen F. Austin, taught agriculture, taught carpentry, and he took the barn and he made each one of us a replica of the barn oh. from the wood of the barn. Oh, cool. Wow. Oh, wow. Cool. What do you do with that? You keep it. It fits in the trunk. <laughs> so I keep it. Absolutely. So I would offer, um, if you're going to keep stuff, keep stuff you just, they can't tear it out of your hands, right? Mm -hmm. Throw it in the grave with me, whatever. But And two... Keep stuff that has a minimalist footprint. <laughs> Otherwise, digitize everything else. Tell the story of everything else, okay? So those are just examples I wanted to offer with you about um, how to digitize. And some stuff, I just, I'll just i digitize it. I think I just did by having that recording while I'm talking. But in the end, I can't get rid of it. I'm not gonna, and this is when I wanna have an Aunt Robbie day, I open up my trunk. And I think about, you know, the, the growing up, I didn't grow up on the farm, but my, my dad and his brothers and Aunt Robbie, during the depression, just getting by, throb, and then, uh, you know, the stuff from that. So I wanna honor that there's just no way I'm gonna get rid of some of this stuff, but I'm being practical that if the kids inherit that, that's, that was, that's the goal. So in summary, um, let's talk. And how are, we, how are we doing on time? I've got to be home by midnight, so I'm just saying. <laughs> Today or tomorrow? <laughs> that was good. But this is the part I'd really like to just do q and A. I'd really like to offer it. But where I'm going to go after the Q&A is just to say that if you go to Answers.Academy, those are the other books that I've done. Um, I put them up on Amazon Book. Uh, Audible, Kindle as the digital copy of it, and then Audible as the recorded. I hire my nephew to do be my reader. So those are the books that are up there. But that's that's the end of the presentation. Let's just talk. What what do you guys think? What are your questions about? What about what about? Please. Can we give a shout out to George Carlin? I love George Carlin. George Carlin did a I remember that. routine called Stuff. And his theory was that people buy a larger house because they want more room for their stuff. Yeah. It's, it's the, have you not seen it? See George Carlin. Oh, yeah, it's keep fun. recording. I actually, I actually copied it all down and did it as, as my final in my speech class when I was in college. I, I think it's so funny. Yeah. I mean, there's some things that he did that are funny, but. Uh, so it, that one is a little risque. I had to change the ending did just you? a little bit. <laughs> but, but check out George Carlin's talk on stuff. Thank you. It's good reference. Other just questions? What about? How do you know where to start with your stuff or prioritize? I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> um, let me ask, let me do this. What would y'all, how would y'all answer that? 
Where, where do I begin? How do I start? No idea. No idea. I will, and it's in the book. It's in the book, but I, I'm just curious. At the beginning. Start at the beginning. Don't start at the second. Start at the beginning. And so where's the beginning? However far back you can take your family and understand their stories and their whatever their oral stories were and their picture books or whatever. I agree, but as I heard her question, she's got a she's got a storage unit, she's got an attic full of stuff. Is that right? Where does she begin? One thing at a time. One box at a time. And actually that's very good. It turns out, you know, there's a lot of books about decluttering, da 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 da. And there's three or four main theories about that. And that's one of the main theories. It doesn't matter as long as you start. There's a book called Atomic Habits mm -hmm. and the James Clear. And he says, if you want to run a marathon, the first thing to do is to go pair, buy a pair of running shoes. <laughs> the next day, go by the front door, put on one shoe and then take it off. <laughs> then the next day, go put on both shoes and take one step. You follow the word, the word picture? Mm -hmm. So it really doesn't matter if you treat it as an incremental process. And I talk in the book, just set aside 30 minutes a day, set aside 30 minutes three times a week, just begin. Mm -hmm. And once you begin, you'll build up momentum. Yes, ma'am. Start with the biggest thing that you think you can part with, and that way you can see your file going down. Don't and take one piece of paper because you won't think you're doing anything. And that's actually the second important thing can I trouble somebody for a little bit of water? Thank you. The second thing is you need to see progress. If I do this and do this and do this and if it doesn't feel like I'm making any progress, I get discouraged. And so um, just that, just start with the biggest thing or something that's visible that I'll be able to see that I'm making progress. And then what's the third thing that the books say? Thank you so much. What would you guess? So where to begin? The obvious, the big stuff that I can see progress. Second argument, it doesn't matter because as long as I'm doing something every day, I'm making progress. Any other ideas? You, you say you can digitize your stuff. Now what do you do with the analog residual of the stuff mm -hmm. you just digitize? There are a couple of chapters about that idea, but then, it, then you look at your stuff and you say, can I live without it? I'm preparing myself for an Aunt Robbie day. Can I, can I live without that guitar? No, sorry, gotta add it. Can I live without that violin? Yeah, I, and then I donate it to a music shop. I give it to Goodwill. I give I donate it. I can give it to my family. But the main thing is just take it out of your life. And there's lots of good ways to do that, right? Clothing, it turns out, is the most difficult. And I did a YouTube about clothing um, books are, the, well, it turns out that books are the biggest difficult, books and magazines, photos, clothing, and then physical music, the albums, the CDs, the A-track tapes, the cassettes. So what do I do with the cassette? You know, there's not much I can do with it. So that, does that help? So, but, the, but typically clothing is the one that we have the most of, that we could, pun intended, shed a little bit. And then books are the other one, of course, secondhand bookstores and et cetera. But I would argue, you don't, I don't have to digitize everything, but by golly, I'm going to digitize my copy of The Pearl by Jane Steinbeck, because I, when I read that when I was in eighth grade, I, I just, all of a sudden, a whole world opened up for me about reading. And I think in a lot of ways, that's why I became a writer. That book was my fulcrum. So I'm not gonna give up that book. You see, you see that? Okay, cool. Good question. Others? I'll, I'll give a tip, something that really worked for us. Uh, I had a piano. You talk about big items. <laughs> and I was a musician, and for decades and decades, this was my piano. Mm. But who needs a piano anymore, electronic keyboard and everything? Not only that, the soundboard became cracked, and all I was doing was putting pictures on top. And it was up through. <laughs> my brilliant wife. I had to take the piano apart even to move it. It was so big. It was a big upright. My brilliant wife said, why don't you just save the keys of the middle octave? And we put those together, and it's up on the wall. It's no bigger than a picture. It's got that chipped middle C on it. It brings back all the pleasure, and I got rid of all the stuff I didn't need. I put it in a bonfire, and she's got a picture of me playing it like uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. with the fire behind me as it went.
Paul, yeah. inspired. Could you all give Bill a hand? That's a, that's a great one. Yeah. Well, the only thing if I could add, I would wish that I could get my camera and tripod and record you standing next to that thing on the wall <laughs> and tell just what you just told. Mm -hmm. Because just the meaning that that has for you, and then my next question while I'm interviewing you would be what value does that piano represent in your life? What value does music represent in your life? Mm -hmm. What does music mean to you? And just let you go on as long as you want to talk about music and the joy of music, the power of music. Idea. So there's your homework. <laughs> I'll come out, I'll come out. We go to church together, so. Oh. <laughs> that's, thank you though, Bill. That's, that's exactly what these things are. And by reducing them like that, where'd you get that idea? Just came to me. Okay. Just came to me. You're and hired. I'll tell you Come to my house. I'll yep. tell you something else. <laughs> Please. The, um, I don't even know what you call it. The front, it's an upright piano. Right. And so the part in the very front, I think maybe it was originally designed to be a player piano. Oh, wow. But that was not set up, but it still had this light open uh -huh. section. I saved that. I would. Thinking... You know, this would be a great picture frame. Yeah, would, would, yeah, totally agree. So it's in the barn waiting. <laughs> so the, the good news there, the good news there, you can also give your children or nephews and nieces homework and say, this is, uh, came off the piano, record, record, record. I've saved it in the barn. I think this would make a great picture frame. I may not get to it, but here y'all, here's a good offer idea. for you if you inherit this. And that, I would hang on to that because that's so cool and especially if, you know, it's impact that it had on Bill. But, um, so I would offer that we just get Marianne's home phone number. <laughs> <laughs> great, great, thank you. Other questions? What about, what about, please? You talked about scanning the pictures and, and so forth, but it's like when you go to different either websites or apps, sometimes you don't know if it's a good one to use or not use. Do you have any that you recommend? I do. Uh, one, if you don't want to fuss with this, there are three or four companies out there that do this. Have you all come across them? What ones come to mind? Keepsake. The one called Keepsake. Keep Keepsake. Keepsake. Okay, Keepsake. Check that out. Did you try it? No, but I've heard people talk about it. Okay, Keepsake is one. Others? I use the free scanner on my iPhone. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But what about companies that I could send my photos off to? Has anybody heard of Legacy Box yes. Yes. in Tennessee? Mm -hmm. uh, they're a good one, and there's another one in California, but just scan, so the, the, the opportunity is to take a box of photos and send it to them. They'll scan it and send it back to you on thumb drive, DVD, or they'll put it up to the web for you for a fee. Will they do letters? Yeah, they will. No, I, they will. I have got letters from my <laughs> husband's mother's side of the family. When they came over to America in the 1840s, wow. and they were stowed away in an understairs office in wow. an old ranch house. Uh -huh. And I have some of the original ones and some that were you know, copied, and I'm trying to transcribe them, but that is a huge job. Plus, I have one of his grandfather's letters he wrote from when he was in World War II, and my husband's letters for me, Vietnam, and my dad's letters he wrote during World War II. So, I mean, I'm inundated with all of these letters, so can I send those like to? You can, so here's the good news and the bad news. The good news is you can send them to these companies. What if they don't send them back? Yeah. What if they get lost? Uh -huh. And it has happened. Mm -hmm. People have sent slides, photos, letters yeah. to the companies, and the companies the lose mail. them. Yeah. Sorry? Or get lost in the mail. Yeah. Or get lost in the mail. You could send it by UPS, yeah. and they guarantee it. So I might UPS or FedEx it. But that's the good news, bad news. But wait. Um, but I've got so many. Let's I mean, go back to just those. Just the letters would fill up that box that I have. Well, but if they're worth recording, they're worth doing. So I, when I had all the original letters from Grandpa here, mm -hmm. um, I paid my digital daughter to transcribe them. That's me. Okay. <laughs> so if you could pay a niece, a nephew, a grandchild, then they're, oh, by the way, they're getting to read the letter. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. that's true. Oh, that was sneaky. Yeah. <laughs> but you're getting a digital letter, you follow? Yeah. So I might pick and choose, but if you could get three or four different nieces and nephews, mm -hmm. they're, they're reading the letters, and you're getting a digital blah, blah, blah. That's an idea. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I do feel, um, I want to go back to your suggestion, I do feel mixed on whether to send them off to companies or not. Mm -hmm. I feel like as long as I kept the time or the children that I can manipulate or pay <laughs> to do it, then I'd rather them do it. Yeah, but exactly. if I take a, um, 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 what I put the uh, iPad? If I take my camera, my camera. It's behind you. Thank you. If I take my camera, and we all have cameras, we all have children with cameras, it turns out these are the world's best scanners. You cannot get or buy a better scanner than these. I hear you. So really, what's ha what you do is you just take the photos. You can put uh, six or eight on the table, take a picture, and then in the computer, you can doctor them up, period. And so that's the quickest way. Would you agree? Yes, and I also use the scan mode. Yeah, you don't have to use photo mode. You can use the scan mode, and it makes it easier. So please. Mark, can you stay and talk to some of these people that would like to uh, talk to you? I understand some of these people have have to go, they have appointments, but could you stick around a while and uh, I, talk to some of them if I'd like to ask you questions? Quick answer is yes. Let okay. me, let's do this one question and then we can, I'll wrap it up in two sentences. Yes. So the question is, what's safe? What's the best way to be safe? Can I burst that bubble? There is no safe. I wrote a chapter about a woman who stored her quilts, or old ancient quilts in a storage unit to keep them safe, and the storage unit burned down. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not being negative. I'm just saying really, truly, there is no perfectly safe. But what you can do is have multiple hard drives duplicate the hard drive. You can have multiple DVDs you can store it up to the cloud. So just like with your money and your savings, don't put it all in one place. Diversify where you put it. That, okay, cool. So let me wrap up. This was fun. Was really fun. I really appreciate getting invited and sharing. Uh, the workshop is an offer on the table for some time in the future. Uh, but in the end, my best offer is this is a conversation starter. Get a copy of it, take it home, sit down with your spouses and your children and say, let's talk about my stuff and what we're going to do. Without question, the land of acrimony is, is peopled by people who don't talk. The land of calm and Aunt Robbie days are peopled by the people who have conversation. So my hope sincere in this book is that you will use it as a conversation starter with your family. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.